Hi, y'all. This is Kristen Chenoweth. Hi, I'm Gloria Stefan. This is Sarah Bareilles. Hi, I'm Patty Lapone. This is Lynn Manuel Miranda. You're listening to the Broadway Podcast Network. Welcome to the Theater Podcast, intimate personal conversations with theater's biggest names. This episode is with lyricist and composer Rob Rakiki, who's probably most known for writing the music and the lyrics for The Lightning Thief, the Percy Jackson musical, which if you have not been following, this musical has had an amazing trajectory. It started out years ago as just a, literally just a one hour small touring show that that Theater Works USA commissioned and he had or they had the creative team had six actors playing over 30 parts I think he said and then it just it went to off Broadway and then it started touring again and then it now it's on Broadway for a limited run and it I have never ever seen a show have a trajectory like that and I think you know that speaks to sort of the generation of the people who really want it um, sort of like be more chill, right? So it it went from the smaller thing, and then the soundtrack was made, and then because of technology and the internet and the way that younger people are now starting to, even people listening to this podcast possibly are are looking to identify themselves on stage or find themselves and and find others who are who are in the same sort of struggle. And oh gosh, it just speaks to so many people. And then Rob here too was saying that even as adults, we don't ever really feel like we find ourselves maybe i mean most people don't i'm speaking for myself i you know i'm always kind of searching for that next thing or searching for that next point of identification or purpose or whatever it is so these stories like percy jackson and even harry potter and the, you know the uh, lion witch and the wardrobe these these young adult novels that have just become movies and become shows or whatever it is they they speak to the nostalgia they create this sense of home i think for for younger people and then it, it starts translating so I wish that all of you could have actually seen this episode visually. I mean, you're going to hear it, but I was just enthralled by watching Rob talk about his love for storytelling. He he started out as an actor, and I can tell like he found his home as a writer and as a composer because he just goes into these modes where his eyes light up. He talks about the need to identify with the characters and care about them and why are we there and and Oh, it, I'm really excited for all of you guys to to listen to this. One more point before we get into it. That he is now the second person recently who's told me how theater helps people, especially younger people, practice empathy. And that's something, of course, you know, in, in the age we are in now where there's a lot of hate and there's a lot of bigotry and there's a lot of racism and there's a lot of whatever it is, toxic masculinity, everything that goes in and around our, our culture. I mean, I'm talking... Of course, what my experience is um, in North America and the United States, but I, you know, as a kind of a global bigger thing where we just need to kind of understand each other. And he said something too, where he doesn't want to have us as a society other other people, where he means like saying it's not us, it's them, it's the others, right? So I don't know. I, I just really enjoyed this conversation. Anyway, I'm rambling a little bit. Sorry about that. <laughs> Let's get into the episode. But before we do, as always, please visit me online at thetheaterpodcast.com. Show your support via thetheaterpodcast.com slash Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N. And find me online on Instagram and Twitter. Please send me a message. I love hearing from everybody. So please enjoy this episode with Rob Rakiki. My guest today is an actor, music director, composer, and lyricist whose shows have been nominated for Drama Desk, Lortel, and Off-Broadway Alliance Awards. He's a member of the Dramatist Guild, Actors Equity, and an alum of the Tony Award-winning BMI Musical Theater Writing Workshop. He wrote the music and lyrics for the critically acclaimed Broadway musical The Lightning Thief, the Percy Jackson musical, currently finishing up its limited run on Broadway. Rob Rakiki, welcome to the Theater <laughs> Podcast. Thanks so much for having me out. <laughs> Okay, okay, so let's go back to baby Rob, little Rob. Where did you grow up? I grew up in, um, well, it, it was considered unincorporated Arapahoe County at the time. Now it's Centennial, Colorado. It's about a half hour east of Denver. Yeah, I, okay, I was going to say, like, like, you were saying names and I had no idea where they plains, were. And then, okay. The Plains. The Plains. Yeah. We're now... Marijuana has become legalized. Yeah. So what was your childhood like? Obviously, it was before legal weed. Uh, yeah. 
you know, I, I did a lot. I, I hung out outside a lot. My dad is like a big hiker too. So we did a lot of like Colorado hiking adventures. Um, but, but like most of the time I was just riding my bikes, you know, and then my parents only listened to, uh, classical music. They love classical music. So we, we would have like the car trips. It was like name that composer, you know, Shostakovich or whatever. <laughs> They're like, great. <laughs> um, but they also love classic musicals too. Like, um, especially if it was like opera singers covering it because they would like, you know, those versions, which, uh, you know, not always my favorite to listen to now, especially as a guy that writes rock musicals. Um, but like the original cast recording of like Candide would be in our car mm. or like West Side Story with like Kiri Tukanawa or whoever. So, so I, you know, I did fall in love with, with some of those classics like that way. Um, but but yeah, and I have, a, I have a twin sister too. And one Christmas we got like boom boxes and we discovered Bon Jovi and, and Bruce Springsteen. <laughs> and, and just and listening all, on the radio? Yeah, and it, just on the radio. And I was like, what is this black magic <laughs> on the radio? <laughs> what is this this devil's music, this rock and roll? Um, and and uh, yeah, I was like obsessed with like soul music when I was a kid too. So like my dad and I, it's funny, we don't, we don't like... I'd be like, Dad, you gotta listen to this, whatever, you know, when I was 13, Radiohead song, and he'd be like, No, no, no. The meter is interesting, but I can't understand the lyrics. Like lyrics are not important to my parents. <laughs> They're so, important to me. Um, but 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 we could get along together listening to to like classic um albums like the, some of the Beatles stuff, but also like some Motown things too. Oh, that really? We could get to. So like you know, that was fun. I I remember dragging my parents to see the Pointer Sisters. Do ain't misbehaving, which was a hoot, I and mean, things like that. So, like, um, but but yeah, it was funny. Like uh, for a guy that grew up listening to just classical music, like the fact that I discovered the chess on the soundtrack, I was like, oh wait, what is this newfangled rock and roll mixed with musical theater? And so I was like, kind of hooked from then on. Of like, oh, I want to, I want to do that. I want to write like pop rock stuff. Well, were you schools. were you originally like? going towards a career of writing classical music? No, or anything, or? no, not at all. I mean, my, my, you know, my dad, you know, he's a doctor, but he was a classical pianist, a really yeah. good one. Um, and my mom was singing in choir. So like, it was just music was around. My grandparents, my grandmothers were both singers. So like, you know, singing things were around, but it was not like, oh yeah, that's gonna, that's what I'm gonna do. Did your parents want you to? No, they, they didn't care one way or another. They're just super supportive. They just knew like little Robbie wants to do you know, Wilson Pickett is, is like talent show in eighth grade. I was like, probably not, you know, the smartest thing to have this little high pitched white kid singing Wilson Pickett, but you know, whatever. <laughs> um, no, Colorado. Uh, but, but, you know, yeah, I, they were very supportive. And I think because I didn't know any better, I just thought, well, uh, yeah, I like doing this. Mm -hmm. I, I want to keep doing this. And then I, I just never stopped. It was never a point where there was like a hard and fast decision. It just kind of things just, oh, well, I'm, this is what I do. I, since like I was first grade, that was what I did. I did a play and then I was like, you know, oh, I like this. And were, were you um, in the play? Were you on stage as an actor? Or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, obviously, there's no pit in a first grade production. N n well, you know, <laughs> I think it was a pianist. It was a play called Going Buggy. I played the the uh, the lawyer who I think the bugs were trying to get equal rights, and I was the lawyer that was like, no. <laughs> but then I had a change of heart, and I'm like, yes, I vote that they do. And I had one line, and I, I literally was like, oh wow, I have so much power on the stage. It was a pure ego at, at the at the start. But then, like, throughout that, I started acting. But I was always writing weird little songs, making up things. My dad would get mad because I would, like, swing the Moonlight Sonata. And he's like, it doesn't go that way. Beethoven doesn't write it that way. I'm like, but it's fun if you, you know. So, uh, yeah, I wrote a really angsty musical. Well, I wrote a really weird one in high school called Mass Confusion. The title given to me by my dad because he couldn't understand the script, which I was like, yes, Mass Confusion. It was like set at a golf course and there were aliens. <laughs> uh, and it was a mess, but it was it was really fun. And there was some, some weird little songs and that. But then I was like, oh, I'm going to be a serious writer. And I had this great idea to write um, – a Jekyll and Hyde musical. I'm born on Halloween. My twin sister and I are born on Halloween. So I, I'm very like drawn to monsters. And uh, I was like, the Jekyll and Hyde musical. And I had I had the poster designed. And my mom at like a Virgin Mega store or something was like, oh, Robbie, look. And it was like a concept recording of the album. It was like early. It was like the mm -hmm. Colm Wilkinson one, like way back in the day. I was like, my dream shattered. No one will hear the silence before the storm. The great song. That, I mean, yes, this is the moment. 
give it up. But <laughs> Robert Kiki at age 13, The Silence Before the Storm for the Jekyll and Hyde musical with a fantastic poster that he designed himself. Man, could have changed the, the world. <laughs> Do you still have the poster? I got it. I got it somewhere. It was really good. I was really proud of it. Dream yeah. shattered. It was it was a good lesson <laughs> to learn early on of like get used to disappointment, kid. Figure out another way of telling what a different your, story. What did your sister end up doing? So my sister is a publicist. She works like literally around the corner. She is like oh, really? the director of publicity uh, at Random House for a bunch of books. She would always give me like the coolest books. She also worked for like uh, a rock magazine, The Deli, for a while. So, mm-hmm. so we first moved to New York in the early 2000s. We were just like going to concerts. Last week we went to see the Pixies together, which we hadn't done in forever. Um, but she's uh, she just was working on Prince's book the, the, that just came out. So mm-hmm. like she's she's very cool. Uh, but but yeah, she would always hand me some cool book that I'd be like, oh, I don't want to read that. She handed me Ham- uh, the Alexander Hamilton book. I was like, this is really dry. I don't know. And then she gave me Gone Girl, which I loved, and The Martian, which was cool. You get mm-hmm. these galley copies. That's yeah. the thing that's so cool about working with. Uh, you know, you know, my sister get these books, and 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 you don't know if they're going to be a national bestseller. You don't know if they're going to be, you know, what they are. You just, she's just like, I got a feeling about this. This is special. And she like share it with me and be like, oh, this is so cool. Um, well, obviously, the Hamilton book. Oh, and influenced a couple influenced people. a couple people. Yeah. But it's isn't that funny too that like how it 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 uh something speak to you and you just immediately latch on. You're like, oh, I see myself reflected in X Y Z, and then it's like, yeah. I gotta I gotta do something with that, or I want to tell my side of the story through that medium or that book or whatever. Yeah, I, th- I think it's interesting. Both of you found your way to New York City. Yeah, and and we literally moved uh, August of 2001, so it was a very interesting time to kind of get acclimatized to New York in the following weeks and and such after. But I think it was like there was something about being in New York in that time too, after you know such you know devastation of of this sense of community and wanting to stick it out and wanting to to like make things and and help people make things and like so I feel like we kind of like. <laughs> were kind of that foundation of wanting to stick it out kind of grew out of that time period. Um, Did you move together? Or, no, or no. She went to school up at this tiny little college, Colby College. I, mm-hmm. think, I think actually Hillary Clinton went there. It's in the middle of Maine, in the middle of nowhere. It's beautiful, but it's like remote. Uh, and I went to school at the University of Michigan. Another UM. Another UM. Another UM. Uh, well, speaking of of books and whatnot, like mm-hmm. – uh, Rick Riordan yeah. obviously wrote the book The Lightning Thief. Yeah. When, when did that book come out? I didn't look this up. I think 2005, I want to say. So it was early, so you were in, mid-2000s. Yeah, yeah, so you were in New York before the book came out. Oh, yeah. 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 I, I, I'm i I'm a little older, so I, I missed the... Excuse me, the craze of 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 the the Percy Jackson books, um, yeah, but I I was a fan of YA literature. Mm-hmm. I, I especially like YA gothic uh, horror and stuff like that. You know, um, Dean Koontz and stuff like that. But but also like earlier in that when I was a kid, John Belair's like the House with the Clock in Its Walls and all that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. That was kind of early YA stuff. And um, I liked horror and I liked like fantasy. Uh, stuff. Um, I read a lot of Hardy Boys. Yeah, yeah. Well, those <laughs> mysteries and things. Yeah, some of those could get great. pretty creepy. I like. I liked them. Uh, but yeah, so I missed that. That the 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 kind of cusp of of when you might get introduced to that. But mm-hmm. I always loved Greek myths. My my mom was also a history teacher, so I had this big book of Greek myths with these scary drawings that I was like, "Yeah, oh, so cool." The Kraken, you know, and everything. Oh yeah. Um, Clash of the Titans was one oh of my, my god, favorite the best movies. with the stop motion Harry. Oh Housen yeah, and the, yeah. The stop motion. Oh, the original my god. one. Not, oh yeah, no, not no. the remake from a couple years ago. But I would say I watched the sequel the other day. I was like really sick, and I just watched the sequel the of the sequel updated remake. one, and it is the, the sequel to the remake to the updated one oh, that right. just came out. I actually like had a blast. I was like, ah, oh, Liam Neeson playing a god. You gotta love it. <laughs> <laughs> I have a particular set of skills. <laughs> That is creating lightning. Zeus skills. Zeus skills. Let me tell you. <laughs> uh, yeah, the, the mythology part, um, is that kind of what attracted you to, to Percy Jackson? I mean, tell me your story of getting... What, what attracted me was I, I was kind of a, a struggling at the end of my, what what am I doing with my life? Uh, and this, this uh, I got a call from a friend of mine, Joe Iconis, who was like, hey, they're looking for writers who write rock music. And this is a thing I think you're going to like. You should put your hat in the ring for this thing. Um, and you know, like, I like all good things. It's usually your friends that like suggest mm-hmm. or help or talk or whatever that like get you out of your funk. I was, I was in a really weird place cause I had just booked 
like this is 2012 ish. Uh, I had booked a show called Pump Poison Dinettes that mm-hmm. that, that uh, was going to have this big revival. John Doyle was going to direct. It was gonna this whole thing. I learned to accordion for like three months as an actor. And uh, this is my Broadway debut. Oh my gosh. I was understudying my old classmate, Alex Jam- Alexander Gemignani. So I was really stoked to see him again. Um, you know, it was, it was like going to change my life. It was, you know, and we, cl- <laughs> we, we got an announcement on Friday that, hey, we're postponing on Monday and uh, our, our like first rehearsal. And I'm like, well, wait, we were all off book. We'd learned, of course, the set had been built, you know, what I'm saying? And, and they were like, yeah, we're extending. And then, or we're, we're delaying. And then another, we're delaying. And then it just was like, it fell apart. And, and as things happen in, in this industry. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think it, it was the double whammy was like that week was the week that another show I wrote called Strange Tales that I had done at Ars Nova ha- was supposed to have a production uh, out in California. And our producers dropped us like that week after a year of like negotiations. Mm-hmm. We went to like celebrate and they were like, yeah, we're going to grad school. So we're not going <laughs> to produce your show. <laughs> it's the best thing for the project. And I was like, well, the best thing for the project would have been not having you have the option for the past year. But whatever um so it was like this double whammy of like losing the show that i love so much uh that i had worked on and losing this thing as an actor so i was just like what am i doing and and i was looking for anything that i could uh as a storyteller because like when your sense of identity has been robbed of you and like the only thing you know how to do is like give me give me a da, 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 da. yeah i was literally chorus line get, you know give me something to, to hold on to here um and that's when i found out about this this project so i i like wrote demos for it i read the book voraciously i thought it was really great um i laughed and laughed and 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 i remembered thinking that like that when i get upset as an actor um or or as a storyteller in general as an artist like ya in particular uh, is so helpful because well, like harry potter you know like the fifth book of the harry potter series is my favorite because it's like the one where he's up against the most you know, the system, man, it's got him down. And you know what I mean? No one believes him. And, and, and that character that Percy, you know, in, in Lightning Thief, that he's this kid that, that just can't get a break, can't catch a break. I, I suddenly was like, I see myself in this kid. Um, and I think we're all in a state of arrested development a bit, wherever we're at. You know, the, the older I get, the, the more I realize that like real life is just high school with more money. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? It's just the same uh, kinds of things of people that are scared and people still trying to win their parents' affections and people still trying to, you know, live in these kind of cycles of pick their, you know, battles of, of other people before them. And I was just, and, and how Greek that is, you know, in the grand scheme of things. So I, I really did love the the book and, and, and I thought, oh, I have a way in with this and, and the kind of angst of those teens. I know how to, how to write that music. What's the audition process like as a, as a composer and a lyricist? Because obviously you're not auditioning like sure. a traditional actor, but you said you throw your hat in the ring. So it's not like Joe right. called you up and said, you've got this. You, no, 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 no. It, it was very much, I had to, I had to earn it. But um, so Joe Trace had seen the book on his agent's desk at the time. And, and uh, Joe Trace is an incredible uh, book writer. It, this was his first musical though. Before, this was before, before Be, Be More, More Chill, Chill yeah. before Netflix, you know, Lemony Snicket, you know, he, he just he loved those Percy Jackson books. He really um, he he uh, was like I, I whatever I have to do to to adapt that I want to adapt that. Uh, and so they did as a play basically. And and very early on in the process, Theaterworks was like, we need to compress more plot. This thing should sing. I think we can. And it was such a coup for Theaterworks. You know, been around forever to get a title this big. We had you know to win over Rick's agents and all the stuff because they've been so badly mm-hmm. burned by the movies and stuff like that. You know, it's just like. Um, we wanted to get the tone right, all that stuff. So, so it was like little battles, picking little battles and getting them to win every time. So Joe had adapted it, and then I, then they chose a bunch of different writers to submit. And like this happens a lot, where different mm-hmm. writers will submit, different teams will submit. Sometimes their music lyricist team, you know, one guy does one, right. somebody else does another. But I submitted like three demos, and uh, that's what got me the job. They thought it fit the best with the tone that they were going for. Um, so, so we were off to the races, but yeah, the, the weird thing is those three songs I think I made for those demos, they're the only songs that have like really not changed that much in the course of this whole craziness of the past seven years of 8 million versions and 20,000 <laughs> songs that were written and cut for this thing. Um, so I think that, you know, it's so funny that like, um, the heart of, and tone that we were trying, I was trying so hard to nail out of the gate. It's like, I, I did a good enough job mm-hmm. of that, that it stuck with us and we're like, okay. I got it. I wonder like, if you, you know, 
Have you ever had the conversation with with Joe Trace about um, whether it was chicken or the egg? Where like they they had the tone in mind, and then your songs fit that, or if they were looking to find the tone, and they're like, "Oh, these these songs are what we want." Like now that we've heard it, that's what we want. I think it's a little of you know, I think it's a little of they know they know what they're looking for, and then it, but they, they don't know how to articulate it. It's just as soon as they hear it, they're like, "Oh, that's it." Yeah. They get it. You know, it's like it fits. Um, and I'm sure the other writers that submitted were fantastic writers, and you know, probably booked other jobs I didn't. Um, but but the 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 kind of heart and humor that the books have, um, it's you know, these are kids from broken homes. They don't have a lot of means. Of course, he has ADHD and dyslexia, but they use they're snarky. They're very they're kind of Americanized. They're you know, if people try to compare it with the you know Harry Potter, which mm-hmm. they're obviously are, are, are examples or are, uh, comparisons to be made, but but um, they're very unique in its kind of that specific tone. And and uh, I, I wanted to get that right, uh, and I and I think that's what the the the, the songs tried to do, uh, and and they were like, okay, yeah, that's a good fit. So the 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 history, I guess, the timeline of of the show in general. You said you mentioned theater work, so theater yeah. works. It was, it, was it them who hired Joe to yeah. them? They like, we want, we have this idea, yeah, we want to capitalize on yep. it. Yeah. So they hired Joe. Joe wrote this play. Then they were like, we need to have music. So they hired me. And then we wrote demos. Then we did a lot of R and D. And Rick's agents would come in. Joe met with with Rick actually, um, and and uh, kind of kind of see how his brain worked. And mm-hmm. you know, we really wanted to win them over because we know the fans had been burned so badly because the films hadn't gotten the tone right. You know, um, you know, it's very hard in a Hollywood system to like, you know, it, it's by committee and I, I don't blame the actors. I don't blame anybody. It's just, it, it's just hard. And I know Rick was disappointed in kind of that, you know, when you let your baby go into someone else's hands, what happens? So I think he was very resident, re, reticent, there we go, <laughs> it's late, um, to, 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 you know, have us take over his, his property again. So we, we had to constantly do R and D. We would like bring in, um, uh, kids that were from Camp Half Blood camps that are in Long Island, you know that they do these like reenactments and stuff. Um, we brought in his, you know, obviously his agents were like, you can't do that, you can't combine that character, you can't this and this and this. We had six actors playing like thirty characters at the, for the original one hour. You know, it's a lot of plot, right? It's a, a nearly four hundred page book we were putting in like a one hour musical at first. Yeah. So it was, a, but it actually became kind of fun in terms of like, great, well we have six actors and we, and we we can't keep combining things, we just have to do it all. Great, we will do it literally like the most. Theatrical, fun, frenetic roller coaster ride, and they'll play thirty characters, and there'll be monsters and things that we'll throw at them, and um, and and so that that's kind of how we at- attacked it. And, and Stephen Brackett came on pretty early in the process. We went with a lot of really fantastic directors, but but Stephen's kind of out of the box thinking. He comes from from like off off Broadway, impossible theater never be able to put this on on stage and and you're like, yeah great we have a monster we got a guy that comes out of a, a wheelchair and turns into a centaur we have a you know a minotaur that's like <laughs> on a murdering rampage we had like bad demon fury things you know how do, how do you wrangle that and make it fun and fast and and truly embrace the theatrical nature of the storytelling um and originally had to tour in a Fan and we had, you know, it's just, it's like so many constraints that we had that actually helped us in the and how we were going to tell the story. Oh yeah, um, you know what I mean? Because it was like these are kids, you know, without much means. So here we are, actors without much means, telling the story with this kind of detritus left on stage, taking agency on how they're going to tell their story. Just like the themes of taking agency of making the change you want to see in the world and all that kind of stuff. Um, it, it, it felt very fitting the kind of the way that we told the story and how we told the story. So what <clears throat> what year did the the theater works tour start? 2013 we had like a little mini tour. We jokingly call it the Minotaur. It was just a <laughs> piano. Oh, I'm filled with puns. We just did a piano and and it, we tested around different schools. Okay, you know, kids are like they're brutal audiences. They'll let mm-hmm. you know uh, <laughs> if things are working or not, or if we did their book justice or not, you know, the fans. And also kids that had not read the books, you had to make sure that they understood the world enough that it wasn't um, as confusing. Mm-hmm. So we did a lot of little mini tours, and then we had a we, we didn't think we'd get the rights to have a sit-down uh, in New York at all. 
uh, um, but uh, Nancy Marietta, Rick's agents, got the rights away from the film studio after the second movie kind of tanked, and we were able to. And and we so it was part of three summer theater. A lot of kids from underserved areas, families that came out and never seen a musical before, got to see this show. It really was special. And and then that because how weird that what happened was. Our little one-hour TYA family-friendly show got nominated against Hamilton yeah. <laughs> <laughs> for Outstanding Musical for, for Lord Tell Award. And everybody was like, what? Uh, and Michael Friedman's beautiful shows. He had Fortress of Solitude, which is such an amazing show. Um, so it was incredible, and I think everybody's ears kind of perked up. And so we, that little one-hour tour toured around for a couple months. Or actually, I think actually almost two years. We had six of those. And then we expanded it you know, and, and made a, a two act and kind of ripped the show apart and started over in a lot of ways, trying to add in a lot of the stuff that we, we had to cut before. And that's where songs like good kid and like these, these main, the main kind of character songs where we actually, as Steven likes to say, instead of cramming more plot, we actually tried to like sit with the characters a bit more to give it a little more gravitas, to raise the stakes a bit more, let the show breathe a little more. Um, Joe likes to call say that it's like before it was the roller coaster and now you have the amusement park, which I like in, in terms of our looking at our show. So that, that was kind of the creation of it. Then the th- thought the show was dead. Well, not dead, just over. It was great. It ran two months at, a, at the Lortel. Mm-hmm. Hooray for us. We did it, you know. Um, everybody seemed really happy. And then um, Broadway Records came, made an album, and that changed everything. Uh, tour, which was amazing. And then we thought the tour was over. And then Broadway, I've never seen a show with the trajectory of a, of a started out as a one hour, you know, TYA show turning into a full fledged Broadway musical. No, that, that's what I have written down here actually was to talk about the, the trajectory. It just went from a one hour thing to this massive two hour Broadway run yeah. or two act Broadway run. Yeah. Uh, how long is it now? It's two hours. It's, it's like it's two hours, 15 and not even it's like, Two hours right. about, but it's it is a two act show, and so and it's and it's it's definitely um, for everyone. It's not designed for kids, and even the little, or I mean, obviously, it's designed for everyone, including kids. But um, the even the original show that was a little looking for a slightly younger demographic, we still wrote it for ourselves. You know, we still were like. What I love so much about the show is you get the wave of laughter from like the the youngins that find the things that they relate to, and then you get a wave of laughter from the adults or whatever when they when the jokes land or the things hit in different places. That's yeah. that sweet spot, which is so so satisfying as a writer, um, and and that's been a joy. Uh, the demographics that we have at this show is unlike anything I've ever seen. That's what I was going to ask about was. Uh, whether you see if it's, I mean, because Broadway ticket prices are more expensive, you have to sure. have a lot more disposable income. So, like going from the one hour tour, Theater Works plays more to younger audiences. Sure. Now on Broadway, which plays more to older audiences, sure. the, has the show maintained, like, obviously, it's maintained an upward trajectory, but in terms of audience feedback, has that changed? Well, I mean, like this, the, the show is a family friendly show, but like any, we've had a repeat guy that keeps coming, he's like 85 who sits in the front row. Um, but we've also tried to keep ticket sale, uh, ticket prices um, low, Think you know, the thanks to our producers, you know, because the theater should be for everyone. And, you know, it is a problem in our industry. Uh, this, this, uh, our, our industry of musicals theater, which we love so much, Broadway, right, is, mm-hmm. is, 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 is classes. It's it's it is. It just is. It's money is unfortunately a a, a a major issue that that prevents art from getting to the audiences it needs to. Um, you know, and 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 so I'm I'm very proud that that our show is able to try to be as um, inclusive as possible um, and and aware of those those things. And mm-hmm. part of the joy of the tour was getting to go to, you know, all these cities all over the country, um, and and you know, in these gigantic beautiful theaters. Um, and 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 be, having families be able to afford to come and see it with with everybody, but yes, there, that is a thing, and that is a you know it's something that we're very mindful of. But you know, if you're paying X Y Z to see a show, you want to see a, a show, you know, and 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 that is a conversation to have too. Of like, what what are you paying for? Do you need spectacle to have? Uh, or is you know, it's, and, and our show does have spectacle. I think in in terms of the the actors and some of these incredible like theatrical moments, I'm not going to give too many things away. Um, 
but it is an it's a really interesting conversation about like ac- accessibility to theater and and audiences. But we have a lot of people. This is their first show they've ever seen. A lot, um, and we have younger audiences, younger or people that are fans of the books that read the books when huh. they were in their teens and now that are in their twenties and thirties that are like, uh, I want to see kind of relive mm-hmm. my favorite character on stage. Um, adults that had are reading the books currently to their kids. They want to come and see it, like date night and stuff like that. It's so funny. I get so many like you know letters and tweets and things from from parents that are like, we took our kids and we ended up having the best time ever, <laughs> you know. And then there are these kids. They're they're there at the stage door every night. They're it's they they um, they see themselves in this show, and and it's the greatest feeling in the whole world. You know, when someone says, "I want to be a writer because of you," or um, I, I want to be an actor or I, this story means the world to me or this story helped me get through whatever and, and, and to see the impact that it's had. I think they're the generation that's going to help kind of keep this industry going and pave the way. And so to not, to not discredit them and to embrace them as an audience is really important for a lot of shows. And I think shows like Be More Chill, shows like Lightning Thief, shows like We Are Tigers or, you know, it, it's, they are appealing to this younger, hungry demographic that I feel like are belittled a lot of time in the mainstream uh, press in, in some ways. And, and they're smart and they're capable and they're going to be the ones running stuff soon enough. You it's, know what it's I mean? So it's my, but like we went to, uh, we went to Arkansas when we started and in, in uh, Arkansas, when we did our out of town, um, you know, before the 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 show started in, in previews, one of the, the the guys that worked there was like, "Hey, raise your hand if this is your first musical," and like half the audience raised their hand. And people said, "In Arkansas, in yeah. Arkansas." And then yeah. and then he said, "Raise your hand if you if you drove here um, from from out of the state." Wow. And, and like the other half of the, it was like, it was nuts. People flew in from Japan. People drew, drew, drove for like hours and hours out to Arkansas in January, in the middle of nowhere to see our show. Um, that's how much this property means to people. And, and that's how much like this cast album means to people. And, and, to, and, and for a lot of people who come from the comic book world or come from the literature world or uh, to bring in a new audience into theater and especially, and this is the, the, the thing I'm not like talking about, but, but I think is actually the most important, a demographic of young boys. Because if we're talking about kind of the world in general and <laughs> toxic masculinity and patriarchy and groupthink and all the things that like, you know, concern me, uh, a lot of that stems from an early age and how we find empathy or not. Mm-hmm. And if you see, you know, if young men see themselves on stage and see empathy and see smart, capable women kicking butt, even in, in fantasy is great because it's a metaphor that, you know, it's not quite so literal. You can mm-hmm. kind of get behind it. Man, that to me feels like a little bit revolutionary in some ways or, you know, or... or it, it's very inspiring to think that these kids, maybe, 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 we're, we're helping the world make it a little bit better. Absolutely. And I can't, I can't remember who I was having this conversation with. So if whoever it is you're listening, I'm sorry, I can't credit you. <laughs> but whoever it was told me that part of what is, I mean, it was Tanya Pinkins. I think it was Tanya oh, Pinkins. Yeah? That, Tanya. That, um, that Kids, people in general, not just kids, but mm-hmm. I mean, to your point, especially kids that need to learn how to how to have empathy and mm-hmm. how to have understanding for for others and feel these other types of emotions in different situations. You only forge those neural pathways being in the moment. Yeah, and unless you're like you don't want to be under stress, you don't want to see people in bad situations mm-hmm. in real life. So by seeing it on stage then you're allowing your brain to actually form those connections and get a better understanding of what empathy is without actually having, I put in air quotes, real situations. Absolutely. Yeah, so that's credit to you for recognizing that as well. But um, absolutely agree that that it makes people, arts in general, but especially theater, and then when you add the music to it, it activates more centers of the brain. I'm, sure, I'm sure. so much about brain chemistry and, yeah. and whatnot. But seeing a musical theater production on stage that speaks to you makes literally is making you a better person. Yeah. And 
what you were saying about people flying in, in from Japan and going to Arkansas in the middle of nowhere, I think my my hypothesis around that is that it's it's they're they're going back to relive that nostalgia. Yes. Because as a child, mm-hmm. like you said, they saw themselves in these books and they yeah. got attached to these books. And it's the same reason Harry Potter's doing well. Yeah. Because well, you go back and you see these stories. Right. And and you know, we 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 see it in in media, in other media, like, you know, obviously the Avengers films and things like that, superhero stories and things like that, which you know always started back in the Greeks, right? Right. But um those the demographic is is family and, and tweens watching all those together, everybody of all ages loves these movies. Why don't we tap into that demographic in theater? It's it's because obviously price, mm-hmm. but also I think it has a lot to do with the tastemakers saying, "Well, this form need, there, you know, there is only room in, on on Broadway for this type of 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 art, and it has to be at this highbrow, whatever." But to me, I think the joy of seeing the, uh, a diverse ca- a, a season on Broadway where you have all kinds of shows. Uh, you can have a freestyle of Supreme and a slave play and a lightning thief and a Moulin Rouge and a Jagged Little Pill. You know, I feel like new musical theater this year has been so thrilling in, in, in like uh, taking charge of, of different demographics and stories and things like the soft power I just saw a couple weeks mm-hmm. ago. Oh my God, so cool. Or like Strange Loop. Um, you know, these shows that are just like pushing the envelope, Octet. I mean, like there's so many cool shows. The Sound Inside, just yeah. this psychological thriller is right? amazing. Yeah, There's so much cool theater happening. And, and I think if you give a platform for it and say it belongs, all of it is valid. And, and, um, and to have an audience that, that it, it doesn't have to be, uh, theater doesn't have to be relegated to just uh, a, certain, uh, a certain income bracket. Of people, I and mean, part of that is economics of getting, you know, trying to figure out other ways to get mm-hmm. people in there. But I think also it has a lot to do with perception, you know, and and I think also a producer's taking a chance and saying, you know, um, how can we do maybe things more like limited runs or or other tours or other ways of getting uh, theater to the to the people. I know that it's a question that Sam Pinkleton and I had uh, a while ago talking about soft power at the public. You know, how do we get? People who we know need to see this mm-hmm. to see it. You know, it's an ongoing, ongoing. Thing. To your point too, to get younger people involved. Younger people in general, I think, are more active on social media. Mm-hmm. And as your life gets older, you you know, you have kids or you get more responsibilities. I found, at least through personal experience, that my my social media attention is has been waning. Mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, like it, you want to spread something by word of mouth. Like yeah. look at the look at be more chill and look yeah. at. Lightning Thief, like yeah. literally these young audiences just spread this su- success by word of mouth. Yeah. And then they've become what they've become. And, well, look and, at Beetlejuice. Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> current current <laughs> Ryan Murphy situation aside. Right. But yes, Beetlejuice revived itself completely through mm. TikTok. Yeah. Which is, you know, what I will call a young person's game. Because <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't want to play that game. Yeah. <laughs> but Yeah. It's I, it's interesting, and I think uh, history will be kind to our show and to the shows of this season. I think 2019 is will, will be a kind of a seminal year people will look back on at theater in general, and like there is a changing of a guard. There is a bit of a revolution in the in the works. I mean, working with friends like Joe Trace and Michael R. Jackson and and. Um, Shakina Nafek and, and Joe Iconis, these these people that I, I adore, that I know, they're breaking down barriers. Mm-hmm. Things are shaking shit up. <laughs> yeah, I think when you're in it for the art and for the for the teaching and not just the money, mm-hmm. like the changing of the guard, I, I take that to mean more of like it's shifting from power to the producers, which producers, of course, will always have to have some power. Sure. But produ- pro- producers back towards... Others towards the the people who are the creators well, and producers that, that are are collaborators in, in another way too. It's mm-hmm. not just producers; it's a, it's just gatekeepers, quite honestly. You know, of like having them be more open to being collaborative mm-hmm. and, and how we get this art made and who gets to see that art. Yeah, I agree. Mm-hmm. Um, you mentioned, I mean, you mentioned comics uh, a couple mm-hmm. times and graphic novels and stuff. Mm-hmm. I have a Patreon account, and I let people submit 
some of their questions, and one of them came in about the Mon- Monster Songs yeah, yeah, yeah. graphic novel. Can we talk about that? Yeah, okay. please. No, so I Monster Songs, the question is, um, I heard about Monster Songs, each story drawn by a different artist uh, who wrote, and you wrote a whole album, a mm-hmm. musical album about it too. So the question is, what exactly is Monster Songs and how do you define it? Well, that was like the, uh, a hard thing for a lot of people to wrap their mind around. I was like, well, it's, it's a graphic novel you listen to. People are like, well, uh, what? I'm like, yeah, it, it's going to be a book. It's have all, all this art from different monsters' points of view. Uh, classic monster archetypes, but done in kind of subversive ways. And and um, and then it ha- the idea would have a different style of art and a different style of music for each monster. Mm-hmm. To kind of hear from their side, but it was exploring kind of through the the the, the lens of this like young young man and and kind of as he's at the cusp of adolescence, exploring things like that scare me, toxic masculinity, or how we other people, um, you know, those kinds of things, but done in a very fun way too. And the so Dave O'Neill originally and I I, I was like I loved his art. He was a, a husband of a, a friend of mine, Melinda Bass, was an incredible singer, and I was like. It just was going to hire him for one panel of one song, and he 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 was like, "No, let me try another one of these songs." And he was a true chameleon. Everyone, all his art, he's just the the sole artist, but it looks like there's like ten different artists, illustrators. Every song is totally done differently, um, and it took five years of work. There's like thirty different. Uh, instrumentalists and, and artists on it. I had to wait to get like the singers I wanted. And I wanted to collaborate with those artists to find ways of things that maybe I knew about them or our friendship to to kind of talk about things that we face. So mm-hmm. like I, I was, you know, Megan Hilty is an old buddy of mine uh, through my wife who understudied her in Wicked, but also through her husband who I used to bartend with. And I wanted her to sing the ghost song, which you're like, how does... Why the ghost song with somebody who doesn't feel seen? You know, isn't that interesting uh, that it would be someone who's kind of a celebrity? I'm like, well, people make assumptions about people like, you know, in, 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 that are celebrities mm-hmm. all the time. And I wanted to have her sing something that felt a little like rock and roll a bit, you know, which is kind of outside what people expect of her. Um, and it's been fascinating to see that song also done by all kinds of different people out in the world, you know. Um, it takes on a different meaning every time someone else sings it. And that's the joy of, because anybody can play it. So, you know, if person color of, is singing the song or if, if, a, if a child is singing a song versus, an, you know, an mm-hmm. elderly person, it's, it's like if people don't feel seen, they get it. You know what I mean? Um, uh, and, and so that was the idea was that each one of these songs would be kind of connected thematically and then have this big ending. And, and uh, it was a joy to work on over many, many years. And, and then the idea was, okay, what if we can make it like a stage show? So we started incorporating the art in it with like projections and things. And then um, a, a producer in London saw it who works in, um, it, it worked at the time at PlayStation and she does uh, VR stuff. So mm-hmm. she is coding a VR game. So you have a couple of those songs there. I mean, the original impulse was uh, to have different writers write songs with me. And the only one of the, that actually happened was, was Joe. I kind of said, I wrote a song about <laughs> a Yeti and a Sasquatch that are like <laughs> best friends. So, uh, but all the other ones are, are, are kind of me working out kind of how I think about the world, like the, the homeless guy down the street from me and near my house in Queens that I've tried to help out many times. I was like, well, how do we, if I try to personify him as like the troll under the bridge that everybody makes assumptions about what's, what is his story from, from his mm-hmm. side and how easily we can dismiss an other someone um, who maybe um, just didn't get the help they needed at the right time. Um, so like, those are things that I think is, is like, they're funny and they're silly, uh, but they're also a little heartbreaking. Like Medusa's song. I wanted to like give Medusa, speaking of Greek myths, you know, she went through a lot. You know? And she lost her head. Yeah. You know, but I wanted to like give back the narrative to Medusa. And I was like, okay, what if it was kind of like an Adele darky spooky <laughs> piano song and who can i who can i uh uh sing who could sing that you know that kind of spooky thing and uh but really rock it out and katrina rose Dedrickson and i um like collaborated and her, she's unreal like it's truly when when she riffs at the end of that thing holy lord it's it's thrilling where can we hear it um so broadway records was nice enough to, to help me release it and they uh so it's distributed through them but you can get it online it's on spotify and they have a full hardcover uh, like graphic novel you can actually read it it's beautifully printed at, Gra- at broadway records can you can you read should you, you can read, you read it, it while, yeah, while you listen to it yeah. oh that's amazing uh and uh, hopefully we'll have you know we were at namps last year I, i've been trying to get into namps the national alliance for musical theater for like 
Mm -hmm. 10 years writing all these like highfalutin musicals that I thought were like so important. And I like submitted monster songs. I was like, this is the weirdest (laughs) thing. It's like part graphic novel, part virtual reality, video game, part, you know, musical. And that's the one they love the most. And that's what they chose. So we did it at NAMP last year. And it was, it was uh, just a blast, man. It was just a blast. Well, I know what I'm going to be listening to on the, on the way home. Please, please. It's fun, man. Yeah. It sounds really cool. I love, I love, Love how technology now, especially, can can take this traditional medium and really well, get, breathe that, new life into yes. it. It speaks to the younger generation. Right. Now well, again. that's yeah. part of I think what Namp was so excited about was like, wow, how can we push the envelope of what immersive means? Because in a perfect world for me, monster songs should be sleep no more, but a musical, right? Yeah. I mean, if it, it, it's it's tricky with sound isolation. Obviously, K-pop was trying to figure out how to do that and th- things like that. I'm very curious to see how they do it as a proceeding show. Um, but but as a musical, as a narrative, it's it's tricky. But uh, we have it mapped out, so fingers crossed, you know, maybe we'll have a production one of these days uh, where we get to combine all those things, that kind of full synergistic intake of art and live performance and maybe like, puppetry or AR and VR and stuff uh, to, to kind of um, experience each monster in a different way so that you, you're, you're put in their shoes. That's, that's the goal. Again, empathy. It's yeah, truly. Yeah. You are know. you are you just keeping an eye out for like an abandoned hotel or something that's shut <laughs> you'd be <down>? surprised? <laughs> but we have not, there have been a couple of scopes out to to Brooklyn uh, warehouses and things like that. Yeah. Oh, and, that'd be so much fun. Yeah, I I love that. I love. Um, yeah, you mentioned the sleep no more. I've been to I've been to that. I've been to then she fell. Oh which yeah. Is still. Oh my god. And there was something I forget. It was the same company as then she fell, but it was like Paradise or Paradise. I couldn't get to see it, but I saw. But, yeah. Well, and what changed everything for me was going to Santa Fe and seeing Meow Wolf. What was that? If you know Meow Wolf, Mm -hmm. it's like an artist colony that basically took over this giant warehouse and they tell this like crazy weird stories, but they're all like these different artists. George R. R. Martin like basically underwrote it for them. Wow. Um, And so it's like the the story that I went to because they change it up. It's like this house that's breaking apart into different dimensions and these aliens are like watching it, but feeling like the sympathy for this family. The family is like the dad's in a cult and the brother and sister like don't know each other anymore. And sister thinks the brother is like uh, a homicidal maniac because he murdered this hamster, but the hamster is actually from another planet, and the <laughs> hamster is like evil, and like, but like, you, but it's like this crazy weird story. But all these different artists design different parts of the house as it's breaking up. So you have this like weird like black and white section, this weird this like Miro fantasy thing, and but the crazy stuff in the house. Like you'll see a little, in the little everything's tangible, everything you can touch and look and feel, and you read like the little kid's journal, and it's got the hamster thing, and you open a portal in it, it like in his bookshelf, and you enter a giant cave, and there's a woolly mammoth, and like the giant. Uh, that was one of his toys that you can actually make. It's a musical instrument uh, and it's got lights and things on it. And there's like this guy that went into a, the house, like will break apart into different weird sections. So like this guy literally w- opened up a, a, a laundry door for like a, a whatever this, the, uh, so I'm using, can't use my words. <laughs> the thing that does laundry, you know, the laundry, washing machine. Uh, laundry, oh. He opens a washing mm-hmm. machine and he like, and it's like a slide and it takes you all the way down to this giant basement where there's like weird monsters and things. It, it was truly like, wow, this is, this is narrative. This is immersive. <laughs> this is the weirdest thing I've ever seen. There was also like silks and dancers that were doing and reenacting the story with a rock band. It was just like. All the things, it was just how wow. cool is it when you have like art and theater and graphic design and all of these these elements coming together with like kind of escape the room and immersive things and multimedia in every single way. And, and it was fun. It was so fun. And just being like, wow, I, I care about all of these people. And, and you can stay as long as you wanted or you could just kind of go through it all and then mm-hmm. leave. And, but you do it all on your own. And it's like, Wow. How cool would theater, if you could create a narrative like that, that you can kind of sit back on your own time. It's like kind of like a video game can do that right. too. Right. But but in real life. Yeah. You well, gosh, I'm trying to to understand your psyche right now. And I mean you mentioned <laughs> the, you mentioned at the beginning of our chat that that you, you know, the time when you got both rejections and and you yeah. were like trying to figure out what to do with yourself and and just the way you've been describing everything, it sounds like you're very cerebral. Mm. And like I, I'm, what you really enjoy is is where you can be transported. Yeah, I do. And the fantasy, like yeah. you, you like aliens, you like other dimensions. You, yeah. you know, you like. I'm sure Lion Witch in the Wardrobe. Sure, sure, yep, sure. Yep. And you know, being John Malkovich, like that whole concept of yeah. going into other people's psyches. Um, like, do do you still do you still struggle with 
with trying to find uh, like your your place in in the present in the in what we know as reality. I mean, it's kind of a weird question, but like where you are now, I would I was originally um, a few minutes ago was going to say something about imposter syndrome, mm. like when you're coming out at the stage door and people say, "Oh yeah, I want to be a writer because mm. you wrote this great thing," and are you like, uh, you know, but why? I'm just me. Well, I feel like you know this year, you know. I, I've, I've like, <laughs> I've gotten a lot of help this year in different ways, like financial help, legal help, and you know, some emotional help. And I, I think part of that idea of like allowing people is coming to terms this year with also allowing people to be moved by something you've written and not dismiss it and and say, well, why not? You know, other people, other friends of mine have written things that have deeply, deeply moved me. I mean, you should see me crying during the goodbye song last night, singing with Iconas, you know. Um, and, and I think it's okay it, it, to, to say, yeah, I did that. But it's not because I'm better than you. It's just I've had more experience at it. And mm-hmm. of course you can you can try that. I, mean, I think we all have a little bit of imposter syndrome. I just want it to be good. I just, I try, I try so hard to say, all right, is this... In keeping with this character, is this in keeping with the tone? You know, you work out all these puzzles of how to tell a story, especially in adaptation. Mm-hmm. And you just want to do right by the source material. You want to do right by the author and by the fans and those the people who do that. I think it's it's a little scarier, it's a little more daunting when it's something that's personal, like monster songs. You're just like, here's a blank page, here's this crazy idea I have. Um, and um, and knowing it could totally fail. But um you just it's literally a song I wrote for the Lightning Thief that was cut. This song called "Try." It was just like literally this song. It's like I'm probably going to screw this up. I'm probably going to screw this up. Let's do it anyway, you know. And and that's what I think as an artist you have to kind of do. You just have to be brave in ways that you that that are terrifying, terrifying because you know people are going to root for you to fail. But for all of that, there'll be one person though, or it could be an army, but it could be one person that says that changed the game for me. That that made me feel seen. That speaks to me in a way that inspires me. And 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 then it it really is meaningful. It, mm-hmm. it, that that doesn't go away. And and I like to have a dialogue with that. You know, with fans on Twitter and whatever it is. Um. To, to to see where they're at, to gauge their temperature, to say, yeah, I'm like I'm with you guys. Let's let's be part of this you know, together. How long did it take to get to this point? Yeah, oh my God, dude, years. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I've been, I, I, I've been at this since 98. I mean, I've been, I'm, I'm, I'm old. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but I think that was the, the interesting thing to me was like really coming to terms many times with disappointment and how you, you um, kind of frame it in your head. I, I, I wrote this, I, I was asked to write an article for backstage and, uh, I was like, oh my God, about advice. And I was like, oh God, what am I going to say? Some platitude or whatever. I'm like such a Debbie Downer half the time. You know, my my wife is like, everything's the worst. And I'm like, even when things are going amazing, you know, you're always like, ah, but it's not good enough or it's not whatever. And and I keep coming back to this this um, this uh, note that I found on a room in Chelsea when I was uh, one of my last auditions as an actor. I haven't, I haven't acted that much lately, but um, I saw this note that some somebody left there and it was on the floor and I pick it up and it's from some mom to their kid. And it was the most beautiful, heartbreaking, just the most, the advice that I needed at the time. I don't know who's this kid's mom was, but God bless them. <laughs> um, but, but I, I put the song, I put the literally the note to, to, to music. Um, and I sing it sometimes for my, my cat 21 kids, but, uh, or, or my pay students or whoever I'm te- I, I teach a lot. But it's like, you know, hi, honey. I just want to tell you that um, for you, some advice. Well, you were searching for that special role. You're doing all the right things. And I know it must not be easy. And then this line, keep doing what you can with what you have. You know, it's just like that. All you can do is just keep doing what you can, where you are with what you have. And I think that advice of is is so pertinent to 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 artists and to and to anyone who just feels like comparing themselves comparing themselves to others comparing themselves to their 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 past work all that kind of stuff it's like you can only do what you can at the time mm-hmm. 
And then the note is like, go and then go to Michael's and make something fun to like spark your creativity. <laughs> it's like super fun, but like such a mom thing to say that it just makes me laugh. Uh, but but yeah, that was the advice I used in that back, backstage article. I was just like, just keep doing what you can wow. where you're at with what you have because that's all you can do. Yeah, you know, it's I the, really like that quote. Yeah, it's yeah. Yeah, listen, listen yeah. to the talk sometime. I'm pretty. I like it. Good on you, mom. Um, okay, so there are three standard questions that I ask everyone to close out every episode. The okay. first one simply is, what motivates you? Uh, uh, oh, man. Collaboration. Um, good stories. Good stories motivate me. Just telling or reading or hearing what? All of that. I read a thrilling book the other day called The River... I was like, ah, it inspired me. I was like, that my dad recommended actually. It's like, yeah, that, yeah. All right. And then the second question is, what advice would you give to your younger self and younger people listening now starting out down a similar path? Well, literally what we were just talking about, you know, don't, the, the idea of, of trying to make yourself into something that you think somebody wants you to be, there'll be plenty of people that are going to try to put you in a box. You just, you know, it's so hard to say, be your authentic, weird self. But, like, your experiences are so unique that if you put those down and you keep doing what you can with what you have, where you're at, um, people will respond to them because our shared humanity is going to be into your specific, unique worldview is the thing that we're going to respond to much more than you trying to, like, you know, pigeonhole something that mm -hmm. we, you think we want us to see. All right, so last question. If you could only see one show for the rest of your life, but you could see it as many times as you want, what would you see? Sweeney Todd. Another one for Sweeney Todd. Uh, well, you know what? Uh-oh. If you want to change it up, I, no. I could say, I could say um, it's such, my three favorite shows are Sweeney Todd, Tommy, and Hedvig and the Angry Inch. So I have to say, like, could I say, maybe Tommy. I really love yeah. Tommy so much, and I'm so excited for the revival. But, like, it, every time, I, I, I like, get something else out of it i just love it so much that, and also the album the original album it's just so yeah. good yeah all right well sweeney todd is a very popular answer so don't feel bad about that <laughs> <laughs> i'm born on halloween what do you want <laughs> all right so everyone please go down and check out the lightning thief the percy jackson musical which closes on january 5th 2020 you can get your tickets at lightning thief musical.com and we can visit Rob online at robertrokicki.com you're mm -hmm. on Twitter and Instagram at rrokix yeah rrokix <laughs> rrokix you can get more of me at thetheaterpodcast.com show your support at thetheaterpodcast.com slash Patreon get me on Instagram and Twitter theater underscore podcast please leave a rating leave a review this is edited by Matthew Hendershot music by Jukebox the Ghost and then Rob thank you for the wonderful chat this oh has gosh. been incredible thanks so much for having me appreciate it Make the world a little colorful